The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. journey. So uh, seek her out, get to know her. She's one of the sweetest people you are going to meet this side of glory. So I encourage you in that. Easter Sunday was a blessing uh, to my own heart. Our our baptism with Seth and the worship was so beautiful and the quartet and I'm the resurrection and the life and then the donuts. Good job, Laura. (laughs) And the, the sweet kids. I had this couple of them come up. One gave me juicy fruit gum. This one sweet little girl wrote me a song on the resurrection uh, and so many notes and hugs. I just love our little ones and I pray we just keep giving our lives to help train and nurture and point them to Jesus Christ. So we love uh, having the kids in our service and just what a blessing they are. This morning we're going to take back up in 2 Peter. So if you would uh, turn there, we're going to be in chapter 2 this morning, a new chapter. And so Uh, Let's turn to chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 3. And as we come to this chapter, I just, Peter sees so much at stake to his readers and and those he's shepherding. In chapter 1, verse 11, he said, uh, In this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you who have been given this gift of faith. You've been diligent to grow and to persevere in becoming Christ like. The reward is going to be unbelievable, abundant entrance into the kingdom of God. Peter wants us to to have that entrance. That's what he's laboring for in writing. And he knows that all hell is set against us entering into this glorious kingdom. And so four times now he's going to come into chapter two and he's going to mention the word destruction. Following false teachers and their lies, he says they, they, they can lead to destruction. And so what is at stake here is this entering into the, a kingdom with abundant blessing and the other is getting off and going down a false path that leads to destruction. It's a broad way that leads to death. And so that is what's at stake here. And so there's some passion in Peter to be careful with false teachers. Guard what you take into your mind. And so with those kind of eternal things at stake this morning, I want us to go to the throne of grace and just pray for what God would have for us here in chapter 2 of Peter. Father, we come before you and there are so many blessings in Christ. So many promises. They're all yea and amen in that sweet Savior. And God, we long for that beautiful entrance into the eternal kingdom. And all I can think of is that abundant supply. Everything saying welcome, enter, accomplished, finished. Uh, You're welcome. Come behold the Lamb of God, Lord, the The entrance is unbelievable because of the work of the Lamb of God and those who have loved Him. And Father, for those who reject Him, for those who want to be the captain of their own ship, for those who want their their fleshly desires, oh God, there's another path of destruction. There's a path where the worm never dies and the fires are never quenched. God, not a popular message in our society, but the truth of your word. And so I pray that every soul here this morning would take note of such different destinations. And so God, I pray this morning that you will awaken us to to be afraid, to, to be on guard against false teachers. I pray, Lord, that we would continue to be those who are diligent to grow into Christ's conformity. God, you use this morning uh, in, in, in the ways that each heart and soul needs that only you know and your spirit through your word can accomplish. And so God, I ask you to do the supernatural this morning. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. 
2 Peter chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 3, and then next week I'm hoping to look at verses 4 through 10. The subject of chapter 2 is false teachers and the danger of following after them. And it seems like a, a strange digression from the glories that we have just seen in chapter 1. It's been beautiful what God has been unfolding through Peter in chapter 1, this glorious gospel. And it just kind of seems like a new thought. <laughs> it feels like a different subject matter. Here's the glorious gospel, how to have full assurance. And now let's talk about false teachers for a little while. And then in chapter 3, he gets back to sanctification and how we grow. So just chapter 2 almost feels like it doesn't fit in this book. However, what I'd like to do is draw your attention to verse 1, uh, verse, chapter 2, verse 1, but false prophets arose among the people. And I don't know if you know this, but you don't start a new chapter and a new thought with but. <laughs> this is uh, the continuation of what Peter has been teaching. And so I just want to give you one little reminder. I didn't know this till college. The chapter breaks in your Bible are not inspired. <laughs> they, they were added later, and they're very helpful to look up verses and say, turn to this chapter and this verse, but they're human. They're, they're mankind putting them in and making the breaks, and here there should not be a chapter break. It's just a continued flow of argument and reasoning for Peter. So we need to follow it, we got to stay in the flow, and we got to pick it up, or we'll miss the glories and beautiful thing that Peter is doing in this passage. And so let's see if we cannot find Peter's flow and thought this morning. Chapter 1, Peter wants us to have full assurance of our faith. We will stand firm if we have full assurance, looking for this blessed coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the reason for that is so that we can rest solidly in the promises of God. He wants you to have full assurance, resting in the promises that He's given to you. He wants that so that we can draw from that the power that flows from these promises that are all yea and amen in Jesus Christ. He wants us to be empowered in those promises and live different lives. And the way you do that is in 1 Peter 1, 19-21, he said, we have a word that's inspired. It's from God. So we've been, we've been given the word of God, and it's absolute truth. And so the way that we're going to grow and be changed and transformed is by getting in this book and looking and seeing Jesus Christ from every angle. And so we have the sure word of God. What a blessing. And then in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 1, Peter says, I pray you grow by the epinosis of Jesus Christ, that real knowledge, that true knowledge of beholding him and becoming like him. And then in 1.5, he says, I want you to be diligent to keep growing in knowledge of the truth. And so if you're not growing, Peter said, you, you forgot the foundation of all truth, Christ crucified and the forgiveness of your sins. If you've lost that, you've quit growing. And so Peter's bringing you back to, you've got to know this. And so as a man thinks, so he is. What we believe and treasure is what we're going to hold to, it's what we're going to pursue, it's what we're going to live by, right? It's just a true principle. And I'm watching so many of you do that in trial after trial. The testimonies of people who said, I would be dead if it wasn't for the promises of God and the nearness of Christ in my life. And that is the only way we can make it. Because all the lies of the world and even the lies of, of church people meaning well can throw things at us and dishearten us. The devil and all of his scheming is that they, they're standing, these people are standing solely on God and His Word because it's truth, and it keeps pointing them to the all-sufficient Christ in their deep pain and in their deep battle. And you guys are learning it, and you're growing, and you're going deeper and deeper in it. So I just want to ask you this. What do you do if you're the devil and his demons to people like chapter 1? How, how do you dishearten and get them off course? How, how can you knock them off base or or ruin them, or bring them to despair. He doesn't want you to have this glorious entrance into verse 11. The devil doesn't look at verse 11 and say, that is so sweet. He hates it. He wants your, your entrance to be destruction. That's what the false teachers are after. He doesn't want that. He wants destruction for you. And so the devil <coughs> has to attack your foundation then. And what is the bedrock foundation that we've been learning? The truth of God's Word as revealed in Jesus Christ. 
That's the bedrock for every believer. Our lamp that guides us in the darkness that we're in today, the, the word that tells us truth and keeps us moving and guiding, that's, that's it. And so the devil's going to come and attack that. He's been attacking it forever. The word of God has been on attack ever since it was inspired. So how do you get someone to put their lamp down and start thinking about life and their trials through their own reasoning and their own thoughts? The thoughts of the world to get them to despair, to destroy them with wrong thinking and wrong living. How do you, how do you get them there? Well, you've got to bring lies into their minds and into their lives. You have to get them to think the devil's thoughts. And so you bring the world and all of its pressures on them. That was First Peter, squeezing them. And the next, you take their sure foundation, the Word of God, and, and you, you change it. You twist it. You pervert it. You introduce lies and heresies to God's people. You make them think they're obeying God when in fact they're denying the Master who bought them. You rub off the edges. You make them think that grace is so that they can sin and fear not, rather than fear and sin not. You try to steal their hope, and in this book of 2 Peter, they're going to come and say, there's no second coming. We're going to take away your hope that he's coming again. We'll remove that, and that's going to destroy them. You play with their lusts and their desires, so they drink them up and destroy themselves while they have a verse to support their behavior. We're sin abounded, grace abounded all the more. I, I can live any way I want. And they'll, they'll find verses to support their licentious uh, fleshly desires. That's what the enemy will do. This is how the evil one works. And he's been doing it since the creation of the world. He twists the words of God and he brought them to our first parents to bring about the destruction of humanity. And so as Peter has shared, I'm about to die I'm about to depart. God has revealed that to him. And he's laying foundations so that you'll remember them after his departure. So that you'll stand and have a glorious entrance into the kingdom of God. That's what Peter wants for you, for his people. That's what God wants for us. And one foundation is that this is the Word of God. And we find all truth and hope for living in this Word. And second, we need to know it well and not let false teachers lead you away from the truth that God has given us in this inspired book. And so we have to seek to know the truth truly. And that comes by saturation, letting it dwell in you richly. The best way to counterfeit anything is the, the way they train bankers is to know money so well that you can spot the counterfeit. And we've got a people who know this truth so well that when we hear the counterfeit, we know it. The devil has been bringing false teachers since the fall. And still today, uh, he says it's going to heat up in the end times with false teachers. So he seeks to come by infiltrating the church of God. And the enemy will bring his people. He says they creep in unawares. We're told in scriptures they're going to come as angels of light. They're going to be reefs in your love feasts. They're going to be sheep in wolves. They're going to be wolves in sheep's clothing. Other way around. It's a big difference. Little Red Riding Hood would have never fallen for that. <laughs> God has His sure word, and the devil has his false teachers. Such an important subject in a tolerant church today, where we just accept anything if they say it's truth. If it's got a Bible verse beyond it, it does not matter if it's in its context. We live in this tolerant age and we don't want to stand up and say, false teaching. It's wrong. Do you realize Peter's going to give us 22 verses on false teaching and he gave us 21 on how to find assurance and grow in it. Don't let that sit lightly on your heart. We've become so tolerant and numb to this teaching that it's permeating our churches and it's making us vulnerable to it. It's the air we breathe and we've got to be aware of it, and we've got to be on guard against it. May God grant us grace as we study through this to have this discernment and not be led astray. I, I just I want to pray one more time, and we're going to open this word up. Oh God, we need this in our tolerant age. Lord, the, the church is permeating, the world is permeating the church 
And it's in our thinking. And Lord, it's, it's a licentious message. It's, a, it's a, 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 a church that has been built on the Holy God, on the Holy Word, by a Holy Spirit, and the holiness of mankind has been abandoned. Oh God, I pray for the false teaching that has led us into this, you know, that it's in to just be apathetic. It's real to not be growing. Oh God, these are lies from the pit of hell. And I pray this morning that your spirit through this word would begin leading us out of any kind of thinking that may have permeated our own minds, getting familiar because our culture has it everywhere. It's over our radios being preached. God, I pray through this word during this season that you meet us and you protect us with truth. And I pray that there would be repentance this morning for any who have been led astray and didn't even know it. God, open your word up and open us up and show us what we need to see from this word this morning. Amen. Our outline this morning, I, I like to try to find my outlines right away when I start studying. And then as I start digging in deeper later, if, if I come across an outline I like more than mine, I just grab it. Because I, I'm, I'm more concerned about you guys getting this text than me being original. So I'm just going to tell you right now, I stole this outline from John MacArthur. Okay? <laughs> So you should get excited. It's going to be better than normal. So what we're going to look at this morning, and someone kind of liked it on the screen at Easter, so I'm going to try it again today. If you hate it, let me know, because I, I don't really like it, but I, I, want to, I want to love you guys and whatever is going to help you the most we want. So eight aspects of the portrait of a false teacher. And we've got to be able to see it, to discern it, to spot it. And so Peter's going to be very clear with these aspects so we'll be able to know when we hear a false teacher. So first, I want to look at a false teacher's sphere of operation. In verse 1, But false prophets also arose among the people. Among the people. The, the, their sphere of operation is among the people. The false prophets... That was just Israel's history. If you go back, as you read your Old Testament, again and again, the false prophets would come on the scene through that whole Old Testament. They would come, and they, in Jeremiah 23, they're saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Cursed are you, prophets, when you go say that false message. That's the worst thing you can tell people, is peace, peace, when there is no peace, and that's happening all over our land. People sitting there thinking they're saved when they have no peace with God. And we just tell them, hey, you prayed a prayer, you walked an aisle, therefore, you're in. And we're just preaching these false messages. Every time Israel was judged, the Babylonians and the Assyrians, there was a prophet who, who would come and say, you know what, you don't need to repent. All is well, God is happy. They were always present throughout the whole Old Testament. And the Jews knew this very well. And now Peter comes and says, in the same way, there's going to be false teachers among you. So these prophets, these Old Testament prophets that were lying, he said, now, church of God, they're going to be among you as well. And they're going to be smack dab in your churches. Naming Christ, claiming to be speaking from his word and speaking in his name. And they're going to be very nice and charming and they're going to just be so caring. And you're going to say, how could anything be wrong? That guy's too nice. He couldn't lie to us. And we just get sucked in and we drink this stuff up like Kool-Aid. So the false teachers, that's their sphere of operation. I just, we're going to move quickly, but I want you just to realize they're going to be among you. And I need you to believe that. They're going to be among you. There, there could be some sitting next to you this morning. I don't want to make you suspicious of your brethren. But if you're a false teacher, we're going to get you. We're looking for you. <clears throat> go to another church. Or don't go to church. Get out of it and stop what you're doing. Okay? That's my application for any false teacher here this morning. Get out. <laughs> Second characteristic is the subtlety of their operations. He says in verse 1, they're going to come <coughs> and they're going to secretly introduce heresies. In Jude 4, which is almost an identical passage to this, he said they're going to creep in. So they're going to creep in. They never are going to show up and say, hey, Southside, I've got some heresy for you. If you'll meet in classroom B during Sunday school, uh, I'll teach it to you. But they're always going to come and say, man, I understand the truth. 
And most often, they're going to promise you freedom by their slant on the Bible. Is I've got a way of understanding this word that's going to give you a freedom that you're dying under these preachers of truth. And they're going to always come with that message. And that is what wins you over. What? There's a way to quit doing what we learned about stroking and Second Peter to get assurance and being diligent to grow in those things. It gets hard. Wouldn't you love a message that just says stop? Just let go and let God and be happy. It's a beautiful message. Quit fighting sin. I got a message so you don't have to fight anymore. And people just, oh, I love that. Freedom. I've been, I, I, this message is changing my life. Yeah, for a year. Until the sin will overcome and overtake you and destroy you. There, there's a way to quit being diligent. Just know who you are in Christ. That's all you need to do. Hallelujah. Who doesn't want to be led up from that battle before it's over? And God says it, it ends when you enter into glory. That's when this battle will end. And, and none shorter. They're never going to be honest. And they're not going to be straightforward. They're subtle. And they're going to come as pastors and teachers and brothers and sisters and the most loving people in your church. They will never say, I have a false teaching that's going to lead you to hell. But I have freedom and I have truth that will make you free indeed. And they're going to sneak in and they're going to introduce you and your church to destructive heresies. They're going to have opinions and twists and slants on the truth of God's Word. They always have a Bible in their hands. But it always leads to factions and divisions in the church. They're divisive. Uh, I've experienced it. I've seen it here. I've seen, I've seen what it does. And the Word is destructive. They're destructive. And this Word means damnation. Peter uses it five times in this letter. And every time he uses it, it refers to the final damnation of those who reject Christ. It's used two times here, just in verse 1. And so this is so serious and so subtle that they're going to introduce heresies that will lead you down a path that will end in destruction. I hear it again and again. Oh, no one could do that to me. <laughs> Peter's saying, you better wake up. Because they're subtle and they're crafty and they're tricky. Don't sit there cocky. Oh, I don't have to worry about this. I know the Word of God too well. In our context, what are some of the ways they might do it? I'm just looking at what Peter's already taught. And they're going to say, quit fighting. You don't have to be diligent in the Christian life. There's a way around it. And I get to hear that one at least once a week. But there's a way to where you have to quit fighting sin. There's a way to be set free from it. Again and again. And this scripture says fight it. Uh, agonize against it. Be a soldier, a warrior. It just says again and again you've got to fight sin because you love Jesus Christ and you've been born again. We've gone through that. I'm not going to preach it again. The other is you just need to fight. You've got to fight your sin. You've got to be different. You've got to change. And that's going to come from your pulpits again and again with no therefore. And they won't come out of the fullness of this gospel that you are loved by God in Christ Jesus and fully accepted. Do you remember that you have koinonia with God in verse 4 of chapter 1? And so if you don't start with this glorious gospel, you are a legalist. And all you're doing is fighting in flesh in your church. Everyone's going to be trying to be holy while sin is growing and getting worse and worse. I've seen it again and again in some of these churches that just preach law. And some of you have sat under it and you've come here and I want you to repent of it this morning. You will not get holy by just fighting and grinding it out. That's a heresy. It's always going to be a therefore. Because of this gospel, go put sin to death by the Holy Spirit. Go be diligent. And we've got to make sure you never reverse these things. And I've watched it destroy and damn many. Hear what I'm saying. Let the Spirit of God give you ears to hear what I'm talking about. Peter had that perfect balance in chapter 1, and some of you don't have it. And I, I want to steal that false teaching away from you this morning to look at this word and begin to see, by the mercies of God, I offer my body a living sacrifice. <coughs> they want to, these people want to dupe Christians, and they want to damn unbelievers. That's what they're after. So thirdly, Thirdly, the portrait of them is the sacrilege of their operations. But false prophets arose among the people, just as there was also false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even 
denying the master who bought them. And this even is like, as if it's unthinkable. They, they will even, even deny the master who bought them. And so I, every heresy is about Jesus Christ. As we saw, every truth was about Jesus in chapter 1. You keep learning about Him and seeing His glory and His beauty. The way you grow is beholding Him and seeing Him. So all truth is about Christ and all heresy is about a wrong thinking about Jesus Christ. And so the rest of the chapter is going to be about a moral problem. He's going to deal with sensuality. But it's a problem about Jesus, not sensuality. You cannot deal with moral problems without getting to the root. And the root is something that you are believing or denying about Jesus Christ. Quit fighting flowers and get to the root. It's an issue about Jesus Christ. And you will even be denying. They'll deny the master who bought them. That means to say no to, to be unwilling. The Greek word means to refuse, and it's in the present tense. Tense. This is a habitual pattern. This isn't, I, I blew it this week and I denied my master. This is someone, there's a, a stated relationship and position. I'm denying my master who bought me. My sovereign one over my life is my sensualities. It's not Christ. That's what they're doing. This truth that is recognized, your character is saying no to the master. That's just who you are. And some of you just sit before God right now and just say, is that what you are? I'm just no to the master. That's what characterizes me. And Peter's going to say, man, that's a false teaching that's led you into false living. The master is despotess, where we get the word despot. And it means a sovereign lord or a ruler or master. The word appears 10 times in the New Testament and it always referred to one who has supreme authority. And so this one who is denying the sovereign lordship of Jesus Christ. And so there are many heresies about Jesus throughout the history of the church. If you've ever taken church history, there, there was heresy about the virgin birth, about his deity. Is he fully God and fully man? His sacrifice, his resurrection. And in this book, there's heresy about his second coming. But the supreme heresy is to say no to his sovereign lordship. Every other heresy is seeking to lead you away from Christ. And I've seen this so many times that it just breaks my heart. You can be orthodox, and you can claim Christ, and you can preach His names, and you can do works, and you can say no to His Lordship. They will not submit their lives to His rule. And Peter will tell us, it's their morality that unmasks them and sometimes not their theology. And their, their lives are what are going to show them. Sometimes their theology, they're going to be twisting, but many times it's just going to be their morality. And they're going to deny the master who bought them. This was slaves who they owed allegiance to their master. They're those who claim to believe in Christ but deny him and they won't come under his rule. They're just kind of, I'm going to use the phrase, playing around with Jesus. Playing around the cross, but never taking it up and carrying it. Guys, this surrounds us like the air we breathe. There are so many twists on scriptures and overemphasis on certain areas that can lead to this kind of a heart. And the American church has been bought into it. We've lost it. Run from any form of teaching that causes you to not want to savor the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Someone's preaching that message. Get away from it. These teachers will not preach in chapter 1, verse 5. Be diligent to supply moral excellence and knowledge and self-control and perseverance and godliness and brotherly kindness and love. They're going to preach licentiousness. These people will honor me with their lips, but their hearts are going to be far from me. And so they, they deny lordship and, and following and coming under Christ. And that, that message, it's false teaching. I want every one of you in this room to know that you can't sit comfortable with that kind of heart before this kind of a Christ. Fourthly, these false teachers will have success in their message. If you'll flip over to verse 2, it says many will follow their sensuality. And so there's gonna, there is going to be a success to these men and women. Many are going to follow after them. 
They're going to fill up the Houston stadiums and all of these places. And they're going to preach, what did Christ say? The broad way, many will enter into it. The broad way doesn't say this way to hell, it says this way to heaven. And so there are going to be many who are going to enter in to the broad way. And just at the end of his days, Jesus said many are going to be led astray. They're going to attract people with all the trimmings of Christianity and nice things, but they will not call people to lordship. Just come to our church, fill it up, get numbers, give your money. But I don't care if you don't surrender your life in every area to Jesus Christ. That's what's going to come. I have a dear brother that we've been meeting for 15 years, and he was a pastor at a very large church here in Highlands Ranch. And he was over premarital counseling. And he said he probably met with 50 couples wanting to get married. And he said, this is no exaggeration, of all 50, every one of them said they didn't know it was wrong to live together before they were married. They said, I thought that was an Old Testament thing. They were clueless. What is that? That's false teaching. That's what's going on here in 2 Peter 2. I pray that you will never be led astray at Southside Bible Church from surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It's the only response to his mercies that he's done on this cross. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, that cl even claims lordship, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, you false teachers, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, you who won't come under my rule. I don't care that you're healing and doing all these things. You would never come under the lordship of Jesus Christ. The popular message is you can have Christ in all of your sin. And I stand against that this morning and I would shake you by the collar if you believed it. That you can't have that. Can't have that. It's a destructive heresy. And we're drinking it up. Fifthly, How's it going on the screens, guys? Is it going all right? All right, thanks, Tim. Timmy. Tim. Tim. I always want to call you Timmy, and it's Tim. The state of their operation. <clears throat> in verse 2, many will follow what? Their sensuality. And this word means sexual immorality. And it's in the plural, which means it's habitual, and there are many forms and many extremes Basically, uh, our country has never been more sexualized than it's ever been, and the amount of pornography and the amount of destruction that goes on on a daily basis just permeates like never before. I'm going to remind you what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4. He said this, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same purpose. What's that purpose? Because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live the rest of his time in the flesh... No longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. There it is. I don't exist for my lusts and my flesh. I now live for the will of God. For the time is past, it's sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousal, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. And in all this, this world is surprised that you don't run with them anymore in the ex excess of dissipation. What? You guys aren't fun anymore. And they malign you. But they shall give an account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. For the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they might live in the Spirit according to the will of God. 2 Peter 1.4 Peter said that we have escaped the corruption that is in the world by our epithemias, our over- Desires. And again, I said that whole world is corrupted by these over-desires to satisfy flesh and to make oneself happy. And now these guys come and they twist the truth so you can have your epithumias. Here you go. Go chase all your over-desires and your sensualities and pleasures. Go run after them. And here's your verses that tell you why you can do it. In our day, sexual sin is rampant. It's running free in the church of God. Pornography and hookup sites and living together and safe sex. First Thessalonians 4 says there's no such thing as safe sex. He says he's the avenger in all these things. He'll bring justice. There's no such thing. 
You take away Christ and His claim on us and His power for us to overcome our sensualities where we're being diligent to labor, to grow in moral excellence and all of these things. I'm diligent. I'm fighting in this current called world that's so sexualized and broken and I'm not giving in. Because of Jesus, I'm, I'm rowing toward Christ-likeness. I will not give up. I'm going to fight by the grace of God and the mercies that I'm tasting and seeing in Him. Don't come up with a theology that allows it. It takes the edge off it. Jesus is okay with it. He understands. After all, we're, we're all under grace. Here's your excuses to be libertines and live any way you want. Jude says they turned the grace of God into licentiousness. They took something as beautiful as grace and used it to sin, to go live any way they want. What an abuse of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You will deny the master who bought you with his own blood. You'll trample underfoot the blood of Jesus Christ. You take the edge off of the Lordship of Christ. And, and as we go through chapter 2, you're going to just see this false teaching says you can live any way you want. And, and teaching how to have His power against lust. Seeing Christ in all of His glory and the promises that light up your heart and give you power to overcome epithumias. If they don't, your lusts will own you. They will take over uh, and you, I'll tell you right now, if you are letting that happen, you will find a teacher who tells you it's okay. And you're going to read some stupid book and he's going to say it's okay and you're going to be like, thank you, Lord. And you're going to go find someone who will tell you that. Grace is not license to sin, but power for godliness. And I pray you get that. It's a power to be changed and conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Sixthly, the stain of it, the stain of it in verse Two, because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. This was Peter's passion in his first letter. Do you remember? He said, our testimony is to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness to his marvelous light, and that when the Gentiles see your excellent deeds, when they get saved, they're going to glorify God because of your excellent behavior. That was Peter's passion, that we live different in this society and in this world. I want you to go shine a light. I want you to be different and bright. That was his passion in chapter, his first epistle. But this is the devil's way. To, to get the people within the church to live in such a way that those outside the church laugh at it. They, they want you to live in such a way that when someone hears you're a Christian, they laugh. Ha, that guy's a Christian. She's a Christian. Ha, ha. It gives them credence to just reject the message of truth. You're not a light. You're not salt. You're just being a, an instrument of the devil to make him say, I don't want anything to do with that. If that's what the truth does in your life, no thank you. I don't need that. It's just so powerful for destruction and for tearing down. To have all of these people naming the name that's above every name and chasing after your own lust like a, a horse neighing after its neighbor's wife as if Jesus isn't enough. You're denying the master who bought you. It's a powerful apologetic of the enemy. That's how he spreads this. People are scoffing at the integrity of the church today because of the false teaching that has permeated it. This gospel is a call to be a light, a city set on a hill that is to go shine and be so different from a world that's controlled by epithemias. we, we got to go shine and show them something that is so satisfying and life-changing and beautiful. To proclaim His excellencies, to walk in a manner worthy, to be growing in moral excellence in the way that we love God and one another. Anything else, they, they can't hear our message because our lives are so loud going, you're a phony and you have no power. You grumble like everybody else on Monday. You chase all the same things. You watch all the same TV shows. You're, you're no different. You don't have any. You tell me your hope is in this while everything about your life is here. And he's saying that's what false teachers do. What the power of God in a life does in this world is beautiful. And what false teaching does in a life 
what it does for the kingdom of darkness is powerful. Seventh, the spring of it. What is the underlying cause? And in verse 3, their greed. Because of their greed, they're going to exploit you with false words. So what is it that drives them on the inside? This is interesting. It's not just their immorality. But the false teacher has a greed. He, he doesn't feel like God has given him enough, right? Christ isn't filling him, so I need the world to fill it. I, I, I have desires. I'm, I'm lusting after things. And so it can be women or it can be money. There's a great desire, uh, something greater than submission to Christ and His truth that's driving them. I want more. That's with Adam and Eve, the devil. I want more. And, and in this chapter, it's sexual immorality. I want more, God. You haven't given me enough. There's an emptiness in my heart that Christ isn't filling. I want this world. I want money and I want power. And these famous false teachers on the TV and radio over all the years, you just watch it again and again. What do they always end in? Immorality with a whole bunch of money and planes and jets. That's where it always goes. Uncontrolled greed. Chapter 2, verse 14, they got eyes full of adultery that never ceased from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed with accursed children. They just never cease from sin. There's a greediness. I need more. I need more. I'll con money out of people. I'll give false theologies so you're happy and you give me more money. God will bless you. Give your money and you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. I'll give it to you. And we'll lie and we'll get money and be greedy and just keep getting everything that I can. My passion is not that you grow into conformity of Jesus Christ. It's that you fill my pockets. In verse 3, they're going to do it with their false words. They're going to twist scriptures to get your money and your following. They want you to follow them, not Christ. That's the passion of the false teacher. They're dangerous. And they will seek to increase your greed as well. I'm going to close out with this last point. The sentence of their operation in verse 3. And this will be the whole message next week where Peter will take it. Their judgment from long ago is not idle. And their destruction is not asleep. (coughs) God has always dealt with false teachers. Korah's rebellion, the ground opened up and just swallowed them. It's not idle is what he says. It hasn't run out of gas. God's judgment against this kind of teaching and following it has not run out of gas. It's still operative. It's going to be brought upon them. It's not asleep. Uh, The executioner has not fallen asleep. He does not sleep or slumber. He's fully awake and he's going to judge it. In fact, the Scriptures tell us the hottest place in hell is for the false teacher. That's a warning to be slow to be a teacher. The hottest places in hell will be for the false teacher. Next week, Peter's going to go into great detail about the judgment that God will bring upon these teachers and those who go and follow their message. You see why we need to be warned? This is so important. It's sobering. Um, it's, it's, it's not as joyful as I'm the resurrection and the life. <laughs> Who believes in me will live even if he dies. But guys, this is so important to our Christian life that we, we fight this thing in our day and age. I want to call for a full-scale church repentance. The Lord has been driving my heart all week for every one of us. To the, there's such a false teaching of our day, it's influenced all of us. It, it creeps in, and you get used to it. And I'm hearing more and more people talk about sexual sin with the edge rubbed off. And it's, just, it, it's, it's becoming so familiar, and greed, and all of these things, it just, it's gotten a foothold in the church of God. And the greed of just wanting more and more, our whole culture It's just about how to get more and more. And some of you, your whole life is just, how do I get more from my job, my families, my neighborhoods? It's just everything is just, I just want more and more and more. And Jesus is, he's just full and he gives you everything that you could ever want or need. And so the true teaching shows you this full Christ who will satisfy every desire, everything you've ever had. 
And the false teacher will keep saying, here, this is what you really need. Here, this will, this will help you. This will make you happy. And it's just going to keep lying to you. And so I want us to repent, which means to change your thinking. I, I've begun thinking like this world. I've begun thinking like the false teachers around me and my culture and to, to turn and go in a whole other direction. To turn to Christ. And what I want you to hear this morning is, is you're not hopeless. The Word of God comes and it cuts and it opens up and it's revealed where you've drifted and your secret place where you're hiding and these sins that are even coming out into public. Maybe you're sitting here contemplating an affair even right now. There's hope. To repent of all the beauties of what we've seen in Christ and the promises of abundant entrance into the eternal kingdom of God is better than anything you're contemplating right now in your mind. Turn to Christ and find healing and washing and, and empowerment. To throw these things down as we hope in His soon return it could be today. And let us be found living for Him when he returns, doing our master's business. That's what he wants from you. And so I want to read to you Hosea as he closes out this book. Israel's been, off, they've been worshiping idols. They, they were literally offering up their own babies to Molech and sacrifice and death. And the things that were going on of the atrocities of what Israel had been doing and listen to what God cries to them. Come. Let us return to the Lord. That's it. Return to the Lord. He has torn us, but He'll heal us. He has wounded us, but He will bandage us. He will revive us after two days. He'll raise us up on the third day that we may live before Him. So let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord, to have epigenosis. Let me press on to know this Christ intimately and all of his promises and who he is let's press on let's reach for that for his going forth is as certain as the dawn and he'll come to us like the rain like the spring rain watering the dry earth what shall i do with you O judah for your loyalty is like a morning cloud and like the dew which goes away early we're not persevering as he said to grow in for I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and in the knowledge of God rather than in burnt offerings. And so I just return to God. Come back to that sweet Christ and making Him and His promises and who He is. Let Him wash you and cleanse you and, and be done with this false teaching and false thinking of our day and age and repent of sexual immoralities and, and come to this sweet Christ and find this, this refreshed heart and, and diligence to row hard after Christ's likeness so that your entrance into the kingdom will be abundant. And as a pastor, that, that is what every one of your elders at this church want. As I, I want you to enter in and have that abundance of seeing Jesus fully and your reward forever. I just want to help you to not get off in false teaching and let Christ get away. And I just want to see you hold and fight the fight of faith the very end where your reward will far outweigh the cost. It'll be a million times better than anything you ever had to suffer, deny, or fight here to glory. So let's grab hands, help each other, keep looking to this Christ. But I, I just want to close with uh, some worship and just repentance before God for how this false teaching may have affected your own mind or heart even here this morning. So let me pray. God, I thank you for this word from Peter. It is sobering, but it, it's what we need. And God, I pray for any sitting here who have come under false teaching. Maybe it was 20 years ago and it still affects them. To this day, they still can't find assurance. They still don't have a therefore in their life. They're just sad and broken and wondering why they can't pull themselves up by their bootstraps. They've been trying so hard to grow and they look back 20 years saying, I haven't even grown. God, that's my heart for them morning that they would look to Christ. They would look to Him for healing in this gospel. That they would find an abundant pardon for squandering and wasting so many years. They would find forgiveness for beholding a gospel that has been letting them live immoral lives. 
letting them just go the course of this world. God, our time has already passed when we were unbelievers to live that way. We're done. And now we want to live for the will of God. We want to live for this sweet Christ who gave himself for us. So God, I pray for healing over Southside Bible Church. I pray for the gift of repentance for any heart, wherever they've drifted and wherever they've wandered with false teaching and false living. God, heal us as we gaze at Jesus Christ now in full repentance and find times of refreshing in him. Even now, we pray. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.